I'm just going to cover the key ideas so that when you read the book, you have an idea to see where it's, uh, where it's going. So let's get started. Now, I'm going to be going off of this PowerPoint presentation, which you can download, and you can follow along, you can print it out, you can, you can do this pretty much however you'd like to. Chapter 1 starts off by defining leadership. Since we're studying leadership, it's a good idea to know uh, what leadership is. And so the leadership that North House, North House provides is really a pretty good uh, definition. I like it a lot. He defines leadership as a process whereby an individual influences a group of individuals to achieve a common goal. So we've got various elements in here. The first you might notice is that you've got an individual who is the leader. You've got a group of individuals who are the followers. And then you have what the individual, what the leader does. And first of all, the individual influences. And that's the idea of having a, an effect on people. And the second key idea is that they're moving towards a common goal. And this common goal is really important. Leading is going towards a goal. Now, what that goal is can strongly influence how good the leadership is perceived to be. If uh, the leader leads people to a goal and they realize that the goal was bad, even though he was successful in leading them to the goal, he'll be perceived as a bad leader. But if it's a good goal, and even if they get there in spite of the leader, uh, he'll be he or she will be perceived as a, as a good leader. Now let's talk about um, some different concepts involved in leadership, different ways of viewing leadership. One of the different ways of viewing leadership is what's known as trait leadership versus process leadership. And we tend to think of leadership as trait process, as a, as a trait, uh, in, in trait terms, but in reality, when we do research, we really find out it's more of a process. So what do we, what do we mean by uh, the trait approach to leadership? The trait definition of leadership is that certain individuals have special innate characteristics or qualities that differentiate them from non-leaders. For example, we know that if a person is taller than average, more intelligent than average, uh, more extroverted than average, is very fluent, and there's a few other traits, that person is more likely to influence other people. And so in this trait definition of, of leadership, the trait approach to leadership, the, you look at the abilities of the leader. And these, uh, the idea is that the abilities reside in select people. And this pretty much restricts leadership to those with an inborn talent. So this is kind of like the traditional, naive, common sense approach to, uh, to leadership. But in reality, uh, we found that can be a lot more complex. Now, trait leadership, we're going to see later in Chapter 2, has a lot of value to it. But there's a lot of other things that are happening in leadership besides having leaders who have certain traits. In process leadership, you look at leadership not as a set of traits that the leader has, but rather as a phenomena that occurs as in the interactions between leaders and followers. And so the leadership is something that is, occurs in the interactions. It's observed in leadership behaviors in what the leader does, but it's going to depend on the followers, it's going to depend on the context, it depends on what the leader does in the specific context with the specific followers, how the followers respond, how the context changes, and it's far more complex than simply a, a bunch of uh, traits. And because it is complex, and it's not just a bunch of innate characteristics, this type of leadership can be learned. So. That, and that's why we have courses on leadership, because I, with a process definition of leadership, you can learn things that are appropriate to make you a more effective leader. 
Now, another distinction that can be made in types of leadership is comparing assigned leadership with emergent leadership. Assigned leadership is leadership based on a position within an organization. People get assigned these leadership positions. Somebody with power says, you'll be the team leader. You're going to be the plant manager. You're going to be a department head. You're going to be the director of such and such. And this leadership um, assignment can be appropriate, can be not appropriate, um, but it comes from, from power uh, within the organization that is assigned to somebody, regardless of the qualities and the leadership behaviors of the person that uh, receives this uh, uh, power. Now, hopefully, the assigned leadership goes to people who will be uh, good leaders in all the senses, but we can compare assigned leadership to emergent leadership. And emergent leadership is leadership perceived by others regardless of that individual's title. It emerges over time through interactions with each other. It's not something that's assigned to somebody, it's like, but it's rather, wow, look at this guy, he's a good guy, he's got some good ideas, or he's a nice guy, I want to please him. Uh, it, uh, it's, uh, um, uh, it emerges naturally based on what the, the leader does in the given context with the followers. So it emerges over time as the uh, leader interacts with other people, and this might involve verbal engagement, getting involved in somebody's life, gathering and providing information that's useful so that everybody can do their job, uh, seeking others' opinions, showing them that they're valuable, showing that they care and that they can contribute to the organization, being firm, clear about what the goals are, but not being rigid, being willing to adapt to the, uh, the situation. Um, it emerges when one has professional competence and people recognize that you know how to do your job, you're an expert. And then it also emerges with interpersonal warmth. When people tell that you care about them, you're able to influence them a lot more. So the emergent uh, leadership is not so much dependent upon what other people, the roles that people assign to you, but it's based on the leader's behavior in the context. It's also affected by their personality and gender and lots of, lots of variables that, that surround the, the leader that um, uh, can uh, uh, influence how the person is perceived as a leader. So that's assigned versus emergent leadership. Now, another key idea with leadership is the, is the concept of power. Because we said in our definition of influence that a leader is someone who influences. And this power, power is, the cap, is the capacity to influence. Now, what do we mean by influence? We can define influence as the ability to change other people's beliefs. If you change what people believe, you're influencing them. If you change their attitudes, if they didn't like something before, but they like it now, you've influenced them. And if you change people's behaviors, if they stop doing one thing and start doing another thing, you've influenced them. And so uh, a leader has this capacity to influence. The, the leader has to have uh, power. Now, power is quite complex. We've all heard the saying, power corrupts, um, but perhaps only certain types of power corrupt. Other types of powers can be uh, uh, really good, and on, perhaps only certain circumstances power corrupts. Um, a good framework for understanding power is uh, what are known as the Bases of Social Power by French and Raven an old uh, paper written in 1959 that still does a pretty good job of explaining the different types of power that people have. Now, these words are not super intuitive what they mean, referent power, expert power, legitimate power, reward power, and coer coercive power, but uh, let's look at them so that we can uh, uh, see what's going on here. Now, this table explains the five French and Raven's bases of power. First of all, there's referent power. And referent power is basically relationship power. Sometimes people like you and they just really want to please you. They want to be close to you. They want to have a good relationship with you. They value your friendship. They value who they 
uh, your your person, your character, and if people, if you have that type of power, that's called referent power. Uh, people want to do what you want them to do because they like you. Um, an example is a teacher who's adored by students has referent power. They want to please the uh, uh, the the teacher. So that's one type of power. Another type of power is expert power. Expert power. It comes from being competent, from knowing a lot, from understanding how to solve the problems that come up, especially in a work situation. Um, so if you're in your work situation, there's somebody who really understands how to solve problems, who understands the issues that are going on. That person has expert power. People will do what he or she says. They'll be influenced by him. They'll change their opinions. They'll gain knowledge from the expert, and therefore the expert is said to have uh, power. Another type of power is what's known as legitimate power. And that's kind of the power associated with a formal job authority. When you sign on with a company, when you're employed, you agree that you're going to obey your supervisor. And your supervisor has agreed that uh, he or she will obey his or her supervisor all the way up. When you enter into an organization, you agree to, un to obey the power hierarchy. That's how organizations work. They've got to have some type of hierarchy, and that's how decisions are made and implemented. And so if you're somewhere in the hierarchy where you can influence other people because everybody has agreed because of cultural uh, beliefs that you should have that uh, power to make those decisions, you have what's known as legitimate power. Now, there's also a couple other types of power that are very often associated with power, and that's a reward and coercive power. Or you could call it reward power and punishment power. Reward power is basically the ability to provide good things to people. Typically in an organization, that's uh, money. You can get a raise if you do good things. If some, the person that can give you the, a raise has reward power. Maybe you can get a promotion. Maybe you can get a better position. Maybe you can get extra time off. That's all reward power. And if somebody has that ability to give you those things, they have report, reward power. Now, the opposite end is the power that nobody likes receiving, but an awful lot of people like having, and that's coercive power. And that's the ability to do painful things to people. Maybe lower people's uh, pay, maybe fire them, maybe give them a demotion, maybe giving them bad uh, job assignments. Uh, it's, uh, it's also a type of power, and people with uh, coercive power if they use it, are often not liked, but they're often obeyed because people don't want to be coerced. They don't want to receive uh, uh, punishment and suffer negative con consequences for what they do. So these provide an overview of five different types of power. So throughout the book, when we talk about power, we'll be coming back to these five different types, and we can see how they can be used for good and for bad. Now we might want, you might have noticed that um, these five different power bases are somewhat associated to assigned power and emergent power. So the ones that are linked to assigned power, we can call that position power. And that's derived from your rank in, in the organization. For example, um, the legitimate power, the reward power, and the coercive power all come from the rank in the association. Uh, your your organization when your boss has these types of uh, uh, this type these three types of power. Another classification, usually associated with emergent power, is the personal power. That's influence that's derived from being seen as likable and competent. People look at you as a person and they say, aha, I want to be influenced by this person because they have what I like and what I need. And so this is closely associated with referent power and expert power. Now, a person can have a mix of both position power and personal power. They're not in opposition, opposition to each other, but they're just basically two, uh, two types of categories of, uh, of uh, how to, to influence people. Now, it's a lot 
easier to change concerning personal power. If you want to be more of a leader, it's easier to change your personal power, your referent power, your ability to your your ability to influence people because they like you, and your expert power, the ability to influence people because you're an expert, than it is to get different legitimate power, different reward power, different coercive power that uh, comes from your rank in the association. So if you want to have greater influence on people, you want to focus on developing personal power, becoming a, a likable and competent because those can be uh, changed very easily uh, and can be uh, uh, depend uh, quite a bit on your own behaviors that you're control of in various contexts and in different relationships. So that's an overview of, tra of chapter one. Now let's look at chapter two. Now the rest of this book, beginning in chapter two, are different approaches to leadership. There's about 10 or 11 different approaches that we're, are, we're gonna look at. None of them describe leadership perfectly. All of them describe leadership to some degree. They're kind of like, um, they're, they're different theories that explain things. Some, tra some theories will explain certain things better than others. Some, uh, some theories won't explain hardly anything except in special circumstances. Some might explain a lot, but we don't have much data for it. Others might uh, explain things, and we have very good data for it, and we exactly know, and we know exactly how much influence uh, such an approach can have uh, uh, in a leadership situation. So we're going to be going through these different approaches and these different uh, theories throughout this course. And uh, this week, we're going to look at the trade approach, chapter two. But uh, next week, we'll look at another approach. Sometimes we'll look at two approaches. Um, and you'll see how, ooh, this theory is applicable in certain circumstances. And I need to know that theory in order to make good decisions in this one uh, specific context. So now let's look at uh, the trade approach. The idea of the trade approach is that there are major leadership traits uh, that, that are associated with leadership. And so if someone wants to be a leader, there are traits to possess or cultivate if one wants to be perceived as, by others as a leader or if one wants to be an effective leader. Now, we've done studies where some traits have emerged that are really good for being perceived as a leader. Um, we know those traits pretty well. To actually be a good leader, the traits that are necessary, we have some idea, but it so much depends on the circumstances that sometimes they're not as useful as we'd uh, like them to be. So first of all, let's talk, off, talk about the traits that are pretty universally uh, contribute to being perceived by others as a leader. And we're going to give some examples, some examples of good leaders, some of leaders that might not be too good. Let's start off with the, uh, the trait of intelligence. And that's kind of like verbal, perceptual, and reasoning cap capabilities. It's good old-fashioned smarts. It, uh, sometimes it's called cognitive ability. And it turns out to be one of the things that we can measure the very best. In all of psychology, measuring people's intelligence is pretty, we've got that down pretty good because it's, uh, it's really hard to fake intelligence. You can fake personality traits, you can uh, present yourself as being just this awesome person, but it's hard to present yourself as being intelligent on an intelligence test um, when you're not really. And intelligent pers uh, people are more likely to be perceived as leaders. We can take the example of Steve Jobs. There is no doubt that he was a smart guy. And lots and lots of people perceive him as an excellent leader because he was so intelligent and led a company that made so much money and produced such cool products. But it's interesting that not everybody perceives Steve Jobs as a really nice guy. 
because he was kind of kind of mean. He would uh, uh, fire people with just a minute's notice. Uh, if he didn't like uh, somebody, if they made a bad first impression on him, he would uh, uh, he could uh, have you fired uh, right away. So other people would say he uh, uh, wasn't a, a, a real good leader. But in terms of indel intelligence, that certainly contributed to him being perceived as a, an excellent leader. Now, it's an, also an important factor in effective leadership, not just being perceived as a leader. All things considered, if you have two people that are going to do the exact same thing in the exact situation, it's better to choose the more intelligent person who's able to process uh, more information and reason uh, uh, more exactly. Um, then the, it's more important to choose a more intelligent person than the uh, less intelligent person, uh, all things being equal. But we'll come back to effective leadership uh, um, uh, a little bit later. Another uh, trait that's uh, um, important for being perceived as a leader is self-confidence. Uh, being certain about one's competencies and skills and one's decisions. Just really being sure of what you're doing that causes people to see you as being a leader. Now, you can be wrong. Hitler had a lot of self-confidence, and people liked his uh, self-confidence. They eventually saw that his approach was wrong, and he went down as a really bad leader. But for a while, he was perceived, especially in his own context, as being a, a really uh, good leader. Um, Steve Jobs is another example of someone who has lots of self-confidence, didn't doubt what he was doing, kept on fighting and uh, doing what he knew that he could do well. Another uh, major leader leadership trait necessary uh, that's associated with uh, being perceived is determination, the desire to get the job done. For example, having taking the initiative, being persistent, the drive to keep going even when things get tough. And a good example of this is Lance Armstrong, who won seven Tours de France. And for years, he fought off uh, uh, accusations of, of drug use. Um, and for, for, I don't know, 10, 15 years, he was just considered an awesome uh, leader. Uh, he over, had overcome uh, cancer. He, he led a big organization known as uh, Live Strong. And he was, he was perceived as being just a, a, a real great guy because of his determination to overcome all the obstacles. Well, not too long ago, he, uh, he admitted to uh, drug use and that he really wasn't... Uh, um, uh, as skilled as people thought that he was, and so his uh, his leadership reputation has completely fallen. But there's no doubt when he was characterized in the media by his determination that he was perceived as a leader. Another uh, uh, leadership trait that's necessary is integrity, and typically, integrity means the quality of honesty and trustworthiness. When we talk about integrity later, we'll see that can be actually much more complex than that. And an example is Billy Graham. Uh, Billy Graham's still alive, but he's pretty old. I think he's in his 90s now, so he's not too much of a leader now. But for well over 50 years, he was the most visible leader of the evangelical mom movement in the United States. Uh, he was highly skilled. He would do these evangelism campaigns that were highly culturally relative during the, the periods that he was doing them. Uh, and he, he, no matter what accusations people made against him, it always turned out that he was trying to really live in a Christ-like way. He was extremely honest and he was extremely trustworthy and none of the accusations against him uh, stuck. Um, he admits that he made some uh, mistakes. He admitted his own uh, weaknesses. But um, in terms of honesty and trustworthiness, uh, he, uh, he pretty much went his whole life uh, uh, being able to to pass the the tests for uh, integrity, and for that reason, he was uh, had so much influence on the evangelical world in uh, in America. Now, another leadership trait that's really valued is the uh, sociability, and it contributes to being uh, 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 viewed as a leader. And that's the leader's inclination to seek out pleasant social relationships. Somebody that 
goes around and interacts with people and has pleasant relationships with them. I think a good example of this is John Wallace, the president of APU. He is genuinely a nice guy. He has great values. He cares about people. Um, he's constantly focusing people towards Christ. He's focusing, constantly refocusing the, the mission of APU towards what's really important in life. And he does it in a really nice way. Everybody likes John Wallace. And he seems to like everybody too. Now, I'm sure there's some people that hate him and oppose him, but he just always seems to be uh, nice. He's a very sociable person. If uh, you send him a Facebook request, he will take you right away as a, as a, as a, as a friend. He uh, tries to connect with everybody and, and create these warm uh, interactions. And so that helps him being perceived as a, as a leader and gives him uh, uh, this uh, the referent power power that uh, has enabled him to, to lead APU to, to growth for so many years. So those are some of the major leadership traits that are pretty universally uh, perceived as indicating that somebody is a leader. Whether they actually are a good leader or not is another question, but this, these traits cause people to be perceived as a leader. Um, now, another set of traits that have been studied quite a bit is what's known as the five-factor personality model. Um, we found that when you look at leader, uh, personality traits, there's five, five personality traits that seem to be re related to all other personality traits. There's kind of like five families of uh, traits. And so uh, social psychologists, personality psychologists, organizational psychologists study these uh, personality traits quite a bit because every personality trait, every behavioral tendency seems to be linked to uh, one of these five. And so the, these five are uh, first is neuroticism, and that's this tendency to worry, which is associated with being depressed and insecure, vulnerable, and people also tend to be hostile and mean uh, when they're high on this neuroticism uh, scale. Another dimension, and all these dimensions are independent. You can be high on one, low on the other. They aren't strongly correlated to each other. They're, they're generally independent. Um, extroversion is this tendency to be sociable, assertive, to have positive energy and talk a lot, maybe to be kind of loud, really outgoing. That's extroversion. And so the low on extroversion is what we call introversion. These people tend to be quiet and get their uh, energy from being alone and maybe do their best work when they're alone rather than in uh, groups. Um, a third scale is openness or open-mindedness, and this is this tendency to constantly want to get information, this idea that trying to be creative, insightful, and curious. Um, it's uh, strongly associated with, uh, with intelligence, but it's more of a personality trait, a behavioral tendency to, to want to get new ideas. Some people are open-minded, other people are not very open-minded. They want to do their duty, accomplish what they're supposed to do. They don't want to continu continually be getting more information. But other people do want to continually be getting more information and integrating it into their life. A fourth characteristic is agreeableness. And this is basically niceness, a tendency to be accepting, trusting, nurturing of others, really caring about others. And conscientiousness is this the tendency to be thorough, to do your job really well, to make, keep working on it until it's done perfectly, organized, controlled, disciplined, dependable, uh, decisive. Um, and uh, that at the lower end, you have more spontaneous, flexible um, people that, that tend maybe not to be disorganized, uh, that tend to be disorganized, uh, uh, maybe procrastinate, uh, maybe have so many good things to do that they have difficulty being on time. So these are the, the five big personality uh, 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 traits that uh, psychologists measure. And it turns out that they're all to some degree associated with um, uh, leadership. 
Um, in fact, there's, we can say there's a strong relationship, a fairly strong relationship between the big five personality traits and leadership, both perceived leadership and effective leadership. It's, it's more difficult to measure how effective a leader is than it is to how, uh, how a leader is perceived. But when you actually measure how much they get the job done, how much leading they actually do, these uh, five uh, traits are associated with uh, um, the... Uh, um, these five traits are associated with leadership. Turns out that extroversion, extroversion is the factor or the trait most strongly associated with leadership. Um, high conscientiousness is also associated with leadership, somebody who's focused and disciplined and get things done. Um, high openness to new information, to new idea, is also uh, uh, related to uh, um, uh, leadership and low uh, neuroticism, not having this tendency to worry, is uh, also uh, associated with uh, um, being an effective leader. And to a lesser degree, high agreeableness is uh, 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 associated with being a, a good leader. It's not as strongly related as the other factors are because. Sometimes to achieve an organization's goal, you have to let people go, go, which isn't very nice. And people that are really highly agreeable might hesitate to uh, um, uh, make the uh, um, uh, m make the decisions that are really difficult in order to achieve the organization's goal. So for that reason, still it's better to be above average in agreeableness, to be a nice guy. But sometimes that can get uh, get in the way of uh, being an effective leader. Now, personality traits are not the only thing, not the only traits that are related to uh, leadership. Perhaps you've heard of emotional intelligence. That's also associated with leadership, even though it's not necessarily considered a personality trait. It's kind of a, a different set of uh, uh, skills that people have. It's an ability. And it's been defined as the ability to perceive emotions and manage emotions in oneself and in others. So if I'm emotionally intelligent, I'm aware of my own feelings, I'm aware of what you're feeling. I can manage my own emotions. So I can be sad when I should be sad. I can be happy and positive and upbeat when I should be. And I can also manage your emotions. I can make you feel positive and upbeat when I need to encourage you to uh, do your work. I can make you feel sad when you've done something that um, uh, is inappropriate so that you won't want to do it again. And, uh, um, but generally, it's, it's creating the positive emotions uh, in oneself and in others that um, uh, fits this definition of emotional intelligent. And the underlying assumption to this is that people who are more able to manage their own and others' emotions will be more effective leaders. Because, in a sense, we only do what we want to do. And so if we can manage our emotions to want to do what we need to to accomplish the goals, and if we can manage other people's emotions so they want to do what they should to accomplish the goals, we're going to be a good leader. So emotional uh, intelligence, which is separate from personality traits, it's separate from intelligence, is also another set of traits that's associated with effective leadership. Now, let's talk about some applications of the uh, uh, trade approach. Now, this trade approach is interesting because it really focuses on the leader. It focuses exclusively on the leader. It asks questions, what traits do the leaders exhibit? Uh, who has these uh, traits? It doesn't ask, what's the context? What are the fo who are the followers? What are the followers doing? What are the traits of the followers? It focuses on the, the leader. So it's a real simple approach. You just have to look at one person to find the traits. You don't have to look at some complex system of a bunch of people interacting. You just have to look at the leader. And so a lot of times in hiring, they use, uh, uh, HR personnel use personality assessments. And uh, organizations want to use these personality assessments to find the right people. And this is based on the assumption that people with certain traits will increase organizational effectiveness. They'll help the organization accomplish its goals.
and that specific characteristics or traits are necessary for specific uh, positions. And so a lot of personality assessment measures for fit. Is this a does this person have the right personality traits to be a leader? Does this personality assessment indicate that the person has the right traits to be an administrator, to be a manager, to be uh, uh, in on the service side, managing uh, customers? Um, the, the personality assessment assumes that it, for any position, there are certain sets of traits that are more appropriate uh, for others. And so uh, different personality assessments are used to measure for uh, fit. Um, there's the LTQ, which is the Leadership Trait Questionnaire. And you'll actually take, part, take this uh, questionnaire and uh, use it to analyze your own leadership traits. So that's a way for testing for uh, uh, leadership traits. Uh, you might be familiar with the Myers-Briggs uh, Personality Inventory. That's the one that uh, gives you different letters and categories like ENTJ, extrovert, uh, um, uh, intuitive thinking judgment. It's a somewhat of a complex way of looking at personality because there's four dimensions, but by having four dimensions, it ends up putting people into 16 different categories. And we'll be looking at this later, and there's pretty good evidence that each type of personality, each of the 16 different personality types, tends to do better in certain jobs than, uh, than others. So we'll be uh, looking at that a little bit later. Now the strengths of the trait approach include several really important things. First of all, it intuitively appeals to followers. Followers want to perceive that, the, that leaders are superior and that they possess special traits. If you think your boss is an idiot, that is a pretty discouraging position to be in. But if you have confidence in your boss, and if you think your boss knows what he or she is doing, then you're going to be a lot happier in your job. So we're motivated to want to see uh, positive traits in our uh, bosses. And this is, this is associated with, with what's known as the romance of leadership, which we'll come back to in a little bit. And so people have this need to view leaders as gifted, and so they like looking for traits in their uh, leaders. Another strength of the trait approach is that for a century we've been doing research on these traits, and it is pretty credible. You can't just use traits to guarantee who will be a really good leader, but we can say that people with this tra this, these traits are more likely to be good leaders. Um, it highlights the role of the leader in the leadership process. Um, certainly, the leader should have something to do with the leadership process. And then also it provides ben benchmarks for uh, what to look for when choosing a leader. We can use the, uh, the personality and trait assessments to, uh, for choosing leaders. But there are also some negatives associated with the trait approach. And the trait approach is often rightfully criticized. First of all, there's no definitive list of leadership traits. There's endless lists of traits that have emerged. We don't, we know some that are very uh, strong predictors of good leadership. Others, it seems so much to depend on the context. And that means, and that's because it doesn't take into the account the situational effects. Different skills, different traits, different behaviors are necessary in different contexts due to the situation. And so leaders who are really effective in one situation might not be leaders in another situation. Um, another uh, uh, criticism of the trait approach is that many lists of all these uh, traits that are necessary are highly subjective. And that's because we're just, it's so much easier to measure people's perceptions of leadership than actual leadership or the leadership outcomes. So research often fails to look at traits in relationship to leadership outcomes and just looks at how people perceives people to be uh, 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 a leader. And its limit, the trait approach is li has limited usefulness for training and development because some traits, some abilities uh, don't have, uh, that aren't very changeable. 
a lot of people can't change bad habits. They can't change how they interact with people. And it's interesting that this is, is one way that uh, Christians can have an advantage because as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit which want, who wants to produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, um, self-control. And these are associated with personality traits. They're associated with conscientiousness. That's strongly associated with uh, uh, self-control. Uh, love and kindness is associated with um, agreeableness. Um, uh, the uh, um, uh, love, joy, peace. Peace is the opposite of neuroticism in some way. Jesus said, don't worry about things. Trust in me. And so Christians have this, uh, ten this ability to, to, uh, to move away from high neuroticism, trusting in God, and not being full of uh, a anxiety. So uh, um, as Christians, we have the power to, to make some changes. And there are some individuals who are open-minded and uh, have enough self-awareness so that they can uh, change uh, um, these characteristics, but a lot of people can't, so that leads to a limited usefulness for training and development. Now, I want to talk about a last topic very briefly, and that has to do with the romance of leadership. Um, the romance of leadership is kind of a critique of leadership theory, which says, oh yeah, we've got to study leadership. The romance of leadership says, do we really? Why do we so much want to study leadership? And uh, there's some interesting findings that have been uh, made in this field of romance of leadership. One is people like to attribute the success and failures of an organization to its leadership. There's lots of things that contribute to the success and failure of an organization. Their technology, the economy, the context, the competition. But people don't like to take those things into consideration when they look at the, uh, um, the success and failures of the organization. They like looking at leadership and giving the leaders credit for success and blame for failures. Um, they don't like looking at the competition. They don't like looking at the economy. Uh, they'd rather focus on leadership. So leaders get a lot more credit and blame than they may deserve. Another factor is we don't know very much about successful leadership. What does it really take in a given circumstance to be successful? We can't do that. We can't go into a company, look at this leader, and say, if you do these things, we can guarantee you that you'll be successful. We just don't know that much about leadership. But we still believe it's very important. And that's why it's called the romance of leadership, because we're attracted to it. Because it's like the idea that, oh, this is a beautiful idea. We need to know what makes uh, leaders leaders. And as I mentioned before, we have this need to believe that our leaders are superior to us, that they can help us, that they'll lead us in the right direction. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting to look at that uh, um, this phenomena from a Christian position. It's kind of like we're looking for a savior. We know we can't do things ourselves, that we're not competent, that our own judgment is not good enough, and so we want to have really good leaders who will, uh, who will save us. But we look at so many examples of good leaders, and we see how they have failed. Well, uh, Lance Armstrong's a good example of that. We'll be looking at some other examples uh, uh, later. Um, but humans still want to, to look towards leaders. Now, from a Christian perspective, we could say that well, what we're looking for is we're looking for a savior. We're looking for someone who can make us whole, who can redeem us, can take us out of our own misery and weakness and connect us with the, 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 the power that exists, the God of all power. And uh, so, so perhaps sometimes we look 
to leaders to play the role that God should be playing in our uh, life. And on the negative side, sometimes we want to become leaders so people will view us as little gods and have so much respect for us and praise us and lift us up and tell us how good we are and, and even, even worship us. Um, when, in fact, it really should be God alone who should be uh, uh, worshipped. In fact, Jesus actually said, don't call anybody a leader because there's only one leader, and that's God himself. Uh, we need to um, have this need for a Savior met in God who sent his son Jesus Christ to save us. And a, a final conclusion in the romance of leadership is that successful leadership is in the eyes of the beholder. We don't have a universal measure for successful leadership. It depends on who's doing the observing. Um, there's a lot of factors that cause people to see success. Um, there's the uh, organizational success. If the organization is doing well, people tend to say, aha, the leader's successful. Even if he's immoral and doing things that he shouldn't, he's being a good leader because the organization is successful. There's also the emotional responses to the goals that are achieved. We can find out that this wonderful leader has actually been doing really bad things, things that we evaluate negatively. And when we find out that a leader has been doing things that make us upset, that we believe are wrong, uh, that will cause um, uh, our view of their leadership to go down, even though he might have been accomplishing other goals that were uh, uh, good. Um, the interactions with the leader. Somebody who talks to us real nicely, who gives us uh, what we want, who makes us feel good about ourselves. Uh, we tend to view as a good leader, even if they're not really accomplishing the goals that uh, have been, uh, that everybody in the organization um, holds together. And then most interestingly, well, maybe not most, but still especially interesting, is that Interactions among followers influence perceptions of leadership. If I think that somebody is a jerk and I start telling other people that that person's a jerk, they're gonna ha their view of that person is going to go down. Even though they might not ever have seen that leader do anything, maybe if that leader never did any, anything bad, uh, he or she will be viewed negatively because of interactions with other followers who might have a negative or positive view of uh, the leader. So here we see that uh, leadership might not have anything to do with the leader. It has more to do with interactions among the followers. So the romance of leadership is a reminder to not put too much faith in leadership theory. Um, there's good things in this class, but it's not going to transform you into uh, this perfect leader who's always going to do the right thing in every uh, circumstance. It's going to give you some principles that, in general, you should be able to do to be a more effective leader. But if you choose the wrong goals, if you accomplish the goals in the wrong ways, if uh, you choose immoral goals, if you're unethical in the way that you treat people and the ways that you influence people to uh, um, uh, accomplish those goals, uh, the principles of leadership that we look at here might not have a very positive uh, effect on your real leadership or how you're perceived as a leadership. Okay, so this has been an overview of the chapter's contents, so chapters one and two. Um, now you can read the text in depth and see the details behind all of this. Um, I hope you enjoy the text, and we'll be going over the next two chapters next week.